Zero senior meteorologist Steph Galter joins me now live in the studio. Steph, thanks again for joining us. A um, few developments in the uh, past few minutes. One, uh, we're hearing from Hawaii. They now on. Um well, the watch has now turned into an evacuation order. People are being asked to move away from the coastline. The other is NOAA, that's the National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency in the United States, is now saying that the whole of the Pacific Basin is now a tsunami warning area. I wouldn't be surprised at that at all. And the problem with tsunamis is they actually move quite fast. They can move around 700 kilometers per hour. And that's because they effectively move like shallow waves because they have such a long wavelength. They just ripple along the surface. So they can move incredibly fast. Having said that, fortunately, the Pacific's absolutely massive. So although they move relatively fast, we still have a while before it will actually hit. So we've got time to evacuate people like we're seeing in Hawaii and elsewhere where we're likely to be hit. Now, another alarming thing that uh, we've also just heard in the past few minutes, the Japanese uh, authorities now saying that they expect another strong earthquake. Yes. Statistically, it is very likely that we are going to get some more earthquakes that are going to be strong. We've already seen aftershocks that have been over seven in magnitude, and that would be a very large and potentially devastating earthquake if it happened on its own. But after this 8.9 earthquake, a lot of the uh, buildings, a lot of the structures are likely to be damaged anyway. So another big hit on that, it could well bring more down. It is likely to be worse than just a seven magnitude earthquake on its own after this one. Now, when we talk about seismic activity, of course, Japan is prone to earthquakes. It's not the first time it's happened there. It's not going to be the last time it'll happen there. What exactly is taking place on well, the surface of the Earth? We've got this picture showing the um, different plates that we've got around Japan. We've got the Pacific plate and the Philippine plate to the east of Japan. And then to the west, we've got the Eurasia plate and the North American plate. And what's happening is the two on the east are going towards the west, so they're hitting each other. And then eventually the two on the east are actually being subducted underneath that other plate. It's happening around eight centimeters a year, which might not sound much, but it's actually quite fast. And so as it goes under, the pressure all builds up until eventually the pressure is too much and then it will let go. And it's that letting go that causes an earthquake. And subduction is the worst type of earthquake if you're looking to avoid a tsunami, because as the earth gets dragged underneath, it will get pulled and pulled until suddenly it'll flick back. And it's that flicking motion that will cause this tidal wave. And that's what we're seeing now. And it's no surprise that the word tsunami is a Japanese word. That's where we saw them first. That's where they were noticed first. And it actually means a harbor wave in Japanese. Right, and we're looking at a picture of the wave right now. Getting back to the surface, as we can see over there, with that wave uh, barreling down towards the coastline. Um, the, uh, the waves that are caused uh, by, by, by the earthquake here, um, with this warning that the whole of the Pacific Basin is now under a watch or a warning, uh, we're talking about a vast area of ocean, aren't we? That's right. I mean, well, usually when you think of something moving a great deal, like if you have a little toy and you push it across a desk, the friction will slow it down somewhat. But because with an ocean, there's not a great deal of friction there. So although, yes, if you're very close to it, you will have a bigger wave, even if you're a very long way away, you can still have a very significant wave. When we had the tsunami of 2007 in Indonesia, that created a wave that went all the way across um, towards Sri Lanka, then it hit Sri Lanka, then it went across towards Kenya. Even Kenya saw that. So yeah, they can travel vast distances. And uh, how good is the science got right now? Because, I mean, we have this earthquake. I mean, this is very large. We've been told it's the seventh most powerful one uh, in history. Uh, and we're expecting another powerful earthquake. So in terms of predicting what's going to happen, how good is it? N not so good, to yeah. be honest. Um, ve we're very good at predicting that there will be, statistically speaking, there will be aftershocks, there will be strong, then they'll gradually decrease, and then things will return to normal. But we still didn't know that this earthquake was going to be this strong. We didn't know that it was happening. Even on Wednesday, when we saw quite a lot of seismic activity in this area, we didn't know that those were pre-shocks until now we've got this massive 8.9 earthquake. We can look back and say, ah, oh, that's what those were. They were just pre-shocks. But we had no way of knowing that until this one hit. And the best defense that all these countries have is just to tell their people, 
to move away. That's right. There's a series of buoys around the Pacific, and those can tell you how the wave is traveling, how fast it's traveling, and how bad it is. Because remember, over deep water, the waves are actually really very negligible. You often can't see them. It's only as they go into shallow water, the waves actually amplify, and then they become big. So when they're traveling over the very deep Pacific, you might not know they were there unless we've got this whole series of buoys, which fortunately we do. So we can now give a lot more uh, we can give a, a lot more um, warning than we could in the past. Okay, Steph, thank you very much for that.